morning, we're going to be in Psalm 8, and the title of the message is How Majestic. And this message uh, will, I hope, inspire you to really grasp the gap in a good way, the gap that exists between us and God. Now, sometimes we mention the uh, concept of there being a gap, you know, the distance would mean we're not close. We can't be close because of a gap. Some gaps are important, and it actually can help us to understand and define the relationship a lot better, and it can help the relationship to go more smoothly, and uh, in, ad in the end, be more close, even though this gap exists. And so it'll make more sense as I go on. I just want to say good morning. You gathered here this morning to worship. You came to see some friends. And uh, you came because you, know, you, you like being together. But the primary reason, of course, always is because God is worthy of worship. That's right. that's right. And so that's why we gather. We gather to sing to him, about him. We gather to pray together to him. Take the Lord's Supper to come in communion with him, also with one another. And then we also come to hear his word spoken to us. And his word uh, gets probably the, the largest section of, well not probably, it gets the largest section of our meetings together. And that's, uh, that's by design. It's because we get to know God better by knowing his word more. Mm -hmm. And this gives us inspiration for worship. God's worthy of it. Psalm 8 has the purpose of reminding those who would read it or sing it, because it's actually a song, of the majestic nature of and greatness of God. That's the whole point of Psalm 8. So let's begin in Psalm 8, verse 1. Here the scripture reads, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens. Now, I want to draw your attention to the top line here. What is the deal with the all caps <laughs> versus same word spelled with just a capital L, why is it different? Does anybody know the answer to that? And you'll see this repeatedly as you read through the Psalms. Yes, Aaron? Is that the designation for Yahweh? That is correct. The all caps one is the, is the name of God. Okay? The all caps L-O-R-D was a way that ancient scribes avoided <laughs> writing out the name of God. Which was Yahweh. And they did this, and if you were going to spell it in Hebrew, it would be Y-H-W-H, because they don't have vowels in Hebrew. They just don't believe in it. Uh, so they didn't want to use the name of God too casually or uselessly. This was out of a desire to not use God's precious name in a wasteful manner. So the very first thing we see in Psalm 8 is a respect for God. And understanding that even his name is not something you just want to let flow out of your mouth carelessly. And he is our Lord, capital L, and the rest of it, lowercase, which is synonymous with, if you're looking for something to, to compare it to, the term master. Yahweh, the Almighty God, is master. And it says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's not a question. You notice this punctuation sign here. It's not a, how majestic is your name in all the earth? It must be pretty majestic. It's not a question. That is a proclamation. That's a statement, an emphatic statement. And that is something that we can learn from this morning. God's name is regal. It's royal. It's special. It's honorable. It's wonderful. Some evidence to this is found in the bottom line. Not all the evidence, but some is found here in the bottom line. Verse 1, you have set your glory in the heavens. The sky above us reveals that you must indeed be pretty incredible. Just looking at the heavens tells me something about you and what you create. The comparison gap is valuable to maintain. Humble questions without the comparison gap between us and God. Humble questions can become angry critiques and demands upon God to answer me. Explain to me. Make it make sense to me. Do what I want you to do. Think the way I think. 
Why can't you just think the way I think? Right. Mm -hmm. But when we understand the gap, that he is massive, that his name is majestic, that he is master, and that his glory is vast, we are able to find our place in things, and that's a good thing. Any parent-child relationship that goes well thrives on an understanding of mom is mom, she's got her job, dad's got his job, and the kids, they're very special, they're precious, they're loved, hopefully they're, they're encouraged and protected, but they're not on the same level while they're growing up with mom and dad. And that's supposed to be that way. It actually helps the household to run better. But God's glory is set in the heavens. We, we can evidence, we can see it in this last week, really for the last several weeks. There's been a lot of conversation about the solar eclipse of 2024, which made its path here across our country. I've always wanted to be like a weatherman. <laughs> So the path of totality, it was called, was the best place to catch this event, which essentially was the moon. And if the moon were as big as a tennis ball here, okay, can I get a quick volunteer to come on up stage? Logan's going to be my, my moon guy. Okay, Logan, you're going to have to be prepared to walk in circles around something. Okay. All right. And then uh, if, the earth, if the moon were the size of a tennis ball, the earth would be the size of a basketball, okay? And so the earth, you know, it spins. It takes about 24 hours to make one circle or, or you know, rotate one time. That's why when it's light here, it's dark on the other side of the world, everybody gets that, right? I'm not breaking the news. The sun, by the way, if the earth were as big as a basketball, the sun would be outside across the street in the parking lot somewhere. If, if we're to keep this to scale, the sun is really, really big. So 93 million miles, and then you get here to the Earth, which is doing this. And then about, tw are, we, are we about 12 feet, would you say? Yeah, if we look at Okay, actually, I'm going to move back here, and I'll have you circle to the front of me. So what happens is the, the moon, all of a sudden, oh, it gets in the way of the direct sunlight that's coming from 93 million miles away. Yeah, and then it keeps moving. And then the sun is unblocked once again. So that's what happens during the eclipse. Thank you very much, Logan. And we talked a lot about it uh, this last week. And in that path of totality, it got dark. It didn't get too dark up here. But if you would have voyaged, anybody, did anybody go down and check it out? No one in this room checked it out? All right, that's cool. Uh, I was going to ask you how it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody watch it through the, the NASA... Uh, feed there, Tony did. How was that? It was pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. It got pretty dark. I made my students watch it too. <laughs> right enough. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> but that makes sense, see, because those kind of things inspire songs. Right. Like Psalm 8, which is in fact a song. And if you were in the path of totality, this is from that NASA feed. This is what, sort of what you would have looked up to the sky and seen if you were Psalms. in that path. And it would have been here and gone within four minutes, and I think total darkness and coverage like this was less than one minute. Oh. <laughs> but it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah right. And in the heavens, we can see cool stuff like this. It doesn't happen that that path, like there's an eclipse every year somewhere, every year or two, but not always cutting through North America. Sometimes it's cutting through the Arctic Circle or through the middle of the uh, Pacific Ocean. This one came right through the United States, kind of, I think it was 12 different states got, got to see the path of totality. So it was a big deal. And if you had cool glasses and you were along the path of totality, this could have been what you saw for just a moment. And these are the kind of things that inspire the notion, at least in part, like it said in the bottom line here of Psalm 8, You've set your glory in the heavens. We can see it in some way, that you are pretty incredible. For less than a minute before that little tennis ball of the moon moved out of the way of our basketball called Earth, this was the sight. It's things like this that got the author of Psalm 8 thinking, how majestic is your name? And simultaneously, if you're that majestic, how small are we? Again, that, that important gap, comparison gap to 
to be able to maintain. Then we move into Psalm 8, verse 2, where it says, even, uh, I'm sorry, it says, though, uh, rather through, I can get this right, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Uh, the avenger. Through the praise of children and infants, God has established a stronghold <laughs> against his enemies. That's how he silences the foe and the avenger? Help me out. Yeah. Because I don't know if that's immediately apparent or evident, but that's why we do these kind of lessons, so we can dig in a little bit deeper. What this is saying is that even the smallest of the small, even the most vulnerable, can understand that, Lord, you are majestic. This is, of course, a hyperbole. What it's saying is that it's evident. God's power, his majesty is, is obvious to even the smallest of the small. The strength of that small praise alone is enough to ward off God's enemies and to silence them. Having a grasp on the majesty of God provides this stronghold for us when our faith is assaulted by our circumstances. Sometimes your circumstances really damages your faith. Your moments that you go through and the things that you endure call God's majesty into question. Whether he's paying attention into question. And in those moments when we're too big and when we demand explanation, God's failure, his perceived failure to protect us or to provide what we were looking for becomes a major problem, a major attack from the enemy and from the foe. But when we maintain that gap of understanding that we're very small and God is very great, when we see ourselves as a child or an infant, our Praise of a majestic God allows us in moments where our circumstances are not very friendly to say, okay, this doesn't make any sense. But there's a lot of things that don't make sense to me. I'm not that smart. I'm not that big. God does not owe me an explanation of how all things are going to go. I can see that in the glory that's set in the heavens. I'm small, God is big, it doesn't all make sense to me, and I'm going to be okay even though my circumstances are shakier than I would like. A praise lifted in a moment when the adversary believes that he has really tied you into a knot demonstrates that God is not defeatable. God cannot be uh, defeated. His stronghold is established. His foe, his enemy, cannot break him because even in the midst of difficulty, the simple are able to praise him. Our enemy sees this, and so do those around us. So my question, rhetorical, is, you know, how do you do in those moments when your circumstances aren't very favorable? Can you maintain the gap, the appropriate gap, between your understanding of who you are and your understanding of who God is. In verses 3 and 4, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, I think, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. The psalmist here, the, the author, the writer of this, by the way, is King David of Israel. So he's a king. He understands what it is to have power. What it means to be significant, because he was the king. To have servants and those kind of things. He got all that because that was his existence. That was his life. So it occurs to him that there are people who sit, who sat below him in the, uh, on the social scale. There were different rungs in the ladder, and he was at the top. And he understood that there were people who weren't as important as he was. In a very unique way because he was the king. There were people who he didn't need to pay mind to. People that he didn't pay mind to. And in that spot, 
that unique spot had occurred to him. Like, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm important. I'm a big deal. I'm the king. There's people I don't pay any mind to. And yet, as I'm thinking about it, here's majestic, mighty God, and he seems to pay mind to everyone. Right. What is mankind, God, that, that you're giving them this consideration, that you're mindful of us at all? Yet majestic God does care for mankind. Human beings matter to God, each one of them. And again, how majestic is your name? It's not a question, it's a statement. As David muses upon this and thinks, great as you are, small as we are, why do you even care about us? Mm -hmm. You're pretty awesome. Don't we find it amazing uh, when the famous or the powerful turn out to be really down-to-earth people. I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. The Rock, he's so famous, he's so powerful, he's so strong, he's so influential, and he's giving away pickup trucks, which he does. He's a really generous guy, and by all accounts, when people meet him, they're like, you know, he's really neat. He's just a down-to-earth guy. He doesn't take himself super seriously. He's just nice. And that's remarkable. Just consider, because it really is special, but just consider how incredible and how unlikely and how special it is that God cares when he really, really, really doesn't have to. <laughs> That's remarkable. The psalm continues in verse 5. You have made them a little lower than the angels. And crowned them with glory and with honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hand. Now this is in reference to who? Mankind. Right? That God is, for some reason, mindful of. God has made them a little lower than the angels. Crowned them with glory and honor. Made them rulers over the works of his hands. God made it, but he lets mankind rule it. It says you put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. You know, we see in Genesis 1 and 2 in the creation account that mankind was in fact made uniquely to all of the other creatures and that we alone were made in the image of God. Described here as being a little lower than the angels. Take a look around. People to your right, to your left, in front of you, behind you. They're God's image bearers. And they're made just a little lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. That person next to you is just a little lower than an angel. That's quite something to think about. Yeah. Wow. Treat them like that. Treat them in accordance with how God made them. And you'll find yourself treating people excellent. Right. Somewhere in the scale, we are greater than all things upon the earth, just a little lower than the angels, or so it seemed to the writer of this psalm, King David. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, has given mankind a role, a job, a place to play, a part to play, rather. And an important one at that. It's not just, you know, like when you're in the school play and, and uh, you know, they, they didn't want to discourage anybody who came and tried out for the play, so they gave you a part, like, way in the back, like as a palm tree. <laughs> and I got to just stand there. <laughs> it's not that kind of role. You get a speaking part. Mm. Yeah. You get a starring role in creation. That's how mindful God is of mankind. He's made us rulers, stewards of this place, which, not to get off on a long, you know, uh, be kind to the earth tangent, but we should talk about that a little bit from time to time. Right. Like God has given us dominion over mankind. Now, we could abuse that, or we could see it as an honor 
and a privilege and out of respect for the God who gave us that role, we can say, hey, you know what? We need to be good to this place that he's given us. I mean, do you like the earth? Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. So it just makes sense to do things that are going to be good for it. Right? right? Okay, end of, end of uh, eco discussion. <laughs> the author of this song knows what that means to set us in this place of dominion. You think about it. Look at this beautiful creature. Right. right? This beautiful creature right here is docile as can be. It's about three to four times the size of the average man. Yet it goes where we want it to go. Gives us what we want from it. It seems to accept its place in the world. It feeds us and makes the world a lot better place. It's three to four times our size, but it provides for us. Mm. Look at this majestic thing. Mm. Nice. This beautiful and ferocious creature is the pattern on our exotic sweaters, <laughs> and not the other way around. <laughs> they don't wear sweaters with people patterns. No. Isn't that beautiful? These wonderful and colorful flying creatures repeat our words. That's a tuna. Yeah. Yeah. Tasty fish. <laughs> These massive fish supply our meals. Lunch counters all around the world are forever changed by the mighty tuna. Without God ordering things the way he has, how different our existence would be. Because these things don't have to mind us or have a fear of us or uh, give way to us physically. Yet they do because we have a special place. A place that God granted us because God is mindful. You know, as the sun on the left compares to the earth, well, wait a minute, that's not quite right. As the sun on the left compares to the earth, <laughs> there you go. So we compare to God. Yes, God has made you wonderfully. Yes, you are an image bearer. Right. Yes, you are a little lower than the angels. Yes, you have dominion over all these fantastic creatures. And yes, you are a tiny, tiny, tiny speck somewhere on this little dot. As the sun compares to the earth, so God compares to us. That's an important gap to be able to understand and to respect. We went on vacation in early March and went down to Florida and hit the beach. And like any good Wisconsin tourist in early March who hasn't seen the warmth of the sun in five months, we got a little carried away. Oh boy. So we hung out on that beach and I burned my feet. I, I forgot to get all the way down there with the sunscreen. Ouch. You know, from 93,000, or I'm sorry, 93 million miles away, the sun burned my feet. Yeah. Yeah. You got to respect that big flaming ball in the sky. Right. You got to know your place. And when you get a little too big for yourself, or you lose your place, you can get scorched. And that throws the relationship out of balance. And that's what Psalm 8 is really trying to communicate. Because this is a lot more like it. The immense size and significance of the sun compared to the earth isn't a bad thing. It's not an insult to the earth. It's what's required for the earth's seasons to exist, for it to be held into the orbit that it's in. The sun provides our balance, warmth, light, dictates seasons and harvests, and all the many other things that matter. Without this, everything about life in this place changes, and it gets out of whack. It's important for us to be able to have that gap and that understanding. 
between God's massive greatness and majesty, and even though we are wonderful, yeah. our humble place in the world. So before we get too serious about ourselves and our important jobs and our bright ideas <coughs> and our big questions, let's be humble to know that however great we might be, our God is majestic and considerably greater and worthy of praise. Which then brings us to the final verse of Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's a repeat of verse 1. The grandiose nature of what's been made speaks to how far above us the Lord Almighty is and requires this conclusion. Again, not a question, statement. How majestic is your name? This psalm of David is a thanks. It's a worship. It's a song and proclamation based upon the notion that all we are and all we have is a gift that's not owed to us. It's given to us by a majestic God. You'll recognize the words uh, of this psalm. It's inspired two of the songs in our old red song books, one of which we're going to sing right now. So Jason, why don't you come on up? It's song number 113 in our song book, How Majestic Is Your Name? And again, statement, not question. All right. 